Um, thank you everyone for coming here today. This is the second panel of the day and the fourth panel of the conference. And this panel is titled um, Debating Popular Culture and Traditions. And we have uh, four uh, presenters uh, for this panel. Um, so I'll just move directly to the first presenter. Um, which is um, um, Shumon Rahman, and he will be presenting, his title is Rumors, Riots, Riots and Social Media, The Demonic Turn of a Pop Culture. Um, so Shumon Rahman is a professor at the Department of Media Studies and Journalism, University of Liberal Arts, Bangladesh. He has written extensively on uh, critical and cultural studies in both Bangla and English in various academic and non-academic journals. His uh, re recent research interest includes critical public health, misinformation, rumor, and its mobility within, the beyond, uh, within and beyond social media and digital afterlife. Over to you, Shumon. Thank you, Hana. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on whichever part you are in. So uh, stay to, to the business as I have only 15 minutes to go and I guess I have quite a lot to cover. So yes, my title, working title of this, you know, would be paper is Rumors, Riots and Social Media, the Demonic Turn of a Popular Culture. I would like to call social media rumors as a form of popular culture as it has the public base and power of reproducibility. The paper I'm presenting today focuses only on how rumors are produced by smaller agencies and individuals, uh, not by the states, as we have now ample knowledge about the role of the states in spreading rumors, both as fact and as conspiracy theories. Popular culture has been viewed as a site of negotiated and oppositional viewpoints uh, as I was in favor of this framework in my earlier work. But in the terrain of rumors hosted now in global capitalism, I observed that it has no longer been negotiated, let alone oppositional, while still being produced at the periphery. Well, as I said, this is not at all a paper, to be very honest, rather a thinking in progress, I, if I confess. So since uh, this is a 15 minutes presentation, uh, I would not embark much upon the historical brighter connection between uh, rumors and resistance, uh, because we all are more or less familiar with the works of uh, James Scott, uh, Ramajit Guho and Lefebvre, on the role of rumor being played by rural peasants, uh, uh, soldiers and other during the pre-colonial times. Um, so uh, uh, given that, uh, let me start uh, the, the uh, actually uh, the core analysis that I, I present, I would like to present today. Such, uh, such a revolutionary role of rumors, especially in pre-capitalist societies and, and the oral tradition, is something that we learned from our classical sociologists. But in finding rumor in playing the same historical role in capitalist and post-capitalist societies would surely be romantic. Again, uh, taking resistance as the only mood to combat power is also a romantic idea as Abu Lagood says. However, Journalism in the age of democracy is the flip side of romanticism as it has taken a realist and rationalist path by taking the dissemination of the authentic news and source as its core practice since its rebirth with the print media. If you look how journalism accommodated rumors in the 1980s and 1990s Bangladesh, you will surely remember a tiny column uh, uh, in the entertainment page titled Hawa Thike Power, where they published all rumors about senior celebrities. Certainly, it would be heartbreaking for a resistance romantic to see how the historically gigantic rumors has been reduced and mummified to such a tiny and harmless existence 
in the print media. The reverts of the free flowing rumor took place since the inception of social media. First with the community blogs in the early 21st century and later on, it moved to the corporate social media, including Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and others. With community blogs, rumors has shown a lot of false promise to become revolutionary and to establish and pro-people platform. Those were locally mediated platforms, either by a voluntary semi-corporate entity or a group of Bangladeshi expatriates of st or students living abroad. Soon, on a limited scale, blogs became opinion makers. Rumors remain an essential part of it, as those blogs allowed individuals to use nicks or fake IDs. So nobody had to take the responsibility of a rumor. This faintly reminds us of the fantastic oral tradition of the pre-capitalist societies where rumors were born and spread out. Yet the blog population was ideologically predictable. On the one hand, you, have, you see a group of bloggers uh, of Bangladesh having a secular, Western educated, pro liberation, anti-Pakistan identities. And on the other, you have another sizable population from the faith-based education system, mainly madrasas, and who will soon become arch rivals of each other. The rest is the history where thousands of rumors were produced and reproduced against each other throughout the decade. The government was quite unaware of its power in the beginning or was quite confused about those tiny initiatives in terms of how to deal with them. But in 2008, the government banned a community blog where some people were allegedly raising money to hire a killer because they wanted to kill a Rajakar who assaulted a Mukti Yuddha in public. That was the first time when an online community blog was blocked by the government. However, the government did not allow any more freedom that they were enjoying in those platforms and gradually took hold of it. All these vibrant blogs quietly went to the history book as soon as Facebook enters the market. The users of blog almost immediately switched to the new global platform, assuming that this platform will be beyond any government's control. They shifted with all their unfinished fights, slanders, bad mouthings, and rumors. However, the corporate giant did not have any intention to serve as a platform of resistance until it has it was necessary for it was necessary for the business. Eventually, the users find themselves under rigorous community standard policy of Facebook, which does not allow them to use all their weapons of expression free flowingly. At this point of time, rumor achieved its threefold new name, misinformation, disinformation, and malinformation. Nobody now remembers the historical role it played during the entire period of anti-colonial struggle. Rather, the global social media giants, due to an increased pressure on them during the times of Arab Spring, Shabak movement, and other mass uprising events, are forced to reduce the space for a politically correct expressions in social media. The national governments, and Bangladesh is no exception, uh, have been repetitively negotiating with Facebook for sourcing the rumors, those go against the status quo. During the time of trouble, such as mass uprising or riots, Facebook becomes too cautious about any suspicious activities by netizens on the platform, and they assign artificial intelligence and third party fact checkers to make sure that the space cannot be used as a point of ignition. Due to the massive awareness campaigns against misinformation and hate speech, a sizable number of social media users become much stronger advocates for a civic space in social media. In this way, the government, civil society, and the educated mass 
form a strong ally against social media rumors. Of course, this is a necessary step to follow and I'm no, in no way against this, but I notice how politically subversive remarks and expressions are treated the same way with racist, misogynist, communal and fascist remarks by the agencies, uh, those work to clean the social media feed. Fake IDs are identified, reported and eventually get banned. Offensive posts are flagged and deleted. Eventually, a clean Facebook feed becomes the most desirable civil agenda in social media for the educated mass. Thanks to the decade-long social media witch hunting by the governments, the educated mass and the clear, uh, clean feed campaigners, the volatility, the volatility has almost gone. Uh, since the last decade of the last century, there has been a hot debate whether the interactive media such as reality television or social media now really empowers the audience. Now, from your Facebook page, a feed, if you look back to the debate, you'll see how surveillant the state uh, encroached upon your home page. Profanity filter civilizes you, and you already are taught and warned about uh, that you are leaving digital footprints here, and Big Brother is watching you. How far the social media rumors are subversive and signifiers of cultural resistance now? One recent research of us shows the perception of the causes of uh, rumors among the grassroots journalists, those who run web-based portals in different parts of the country. The findings are quite interesting. Most of the respondents mentioned that the cause for spreading misinformation is mainly financial. Monetization is at the cost of anything is the underlying cause of rumors. Hate speech, xenophobia, misogyny are most, in most cases, the secondary reasons. And that such type of statement can bring more traffic for them. So all the violent statements, falsifications, racial remarks, nightmarish images, and offensive harms have now very little intention to challenge the status quo. Rather, they are just tiny customers of Google AdSense. Apart from monetization, if you look at other underpinnings, they will surely be frustrating for a resistance framework. I'll focus on three recent events. First, the Kumila riot. Structurally, it was against the disempowered, the Hindus in particular. And the rumor traveled more than a thousand miles all over in South Asia, but in all places, it attacked the minorities, such as you know, Muslims in, in India. The Indian rumors emphasized on the exaggerated version of the attack on the Hindus in Bangladesh. At one point, it became rumors against rumors and the most vulnerable communities in both countries remain the helpless hostages of that. To the utter frustration of my provocation to the idea of resistance, no rumor questions the connection of or validity of the power structure and held it responsible for whatever happened rather act as a negotiating force to convince the authority with the narrative they produce. So I had to conclude that the domination resistance exists is not in service here. Second incident that I would like to quote is the Padda Shetu rumor you are all aware of. I'm still at a loss um, with my theoretical framework when it comes to the question of the Padda breeze that it its pillars needed children's head to stand firmly on the river, so the rumor says. Was it against the power? Initially, maybe. But what is the outcome? Are rumors used to denying, uh, used in denying a development, justifying mob lynching, beating an innocent woman to death just because she went to school to collect her son? Uh, is the mob lynching a signifier of any anger or frustration against the existing power structure by any means? Some will say this is the people's version of the state-sponsored crossfire, but against whom? Where there is power, there is resistance, says Foucault. But what a misfire of resistance. I have had a full-length textual analysis of all the media content available on that incidence. 
but none of them could save the incident from being Shumon, actually sorry to interrupt, one. but you have one minute to wrap yeah, up. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up in one minute, I guess. So the third one is anti-vaccine rumors. Throughout the pandemic, several anti-vaccine rumors were shared in social media, mostly as theoretical promotion, uh, theological promotions. Of course, those can be interpreted as an anti-imperialist stance by a diehard romantic sociologist. But was it any helpful for a mass uprising? Did it bring about any physical or spiritual herd immunity? When the COVID-19 broke out in Western countries, the rest of the world termed it a Western disease or rumor. And the Bangladesh is, Bangladesh is no exception. When it hits the urban centers of Bangladesh, the rural community was reluctant, rumored it as an urban disease. However, the second wave did not provide them with any waiver. The invincible pandemic has now buried all the rumors without any further resistance, all quiet on the theological front. All the powerful spiritual healers and the muktis had to swallow their own utterances. Some had to rewrite their own social media statuses as well. So that reminds me of Rashomon, the famous story of Ryunosuke Akutagawa. Uh, I'm just taking one more minute. Uh, a man just fired from the job awaiting at the end of the re rain near to a haunted house. Mm, the house was dumping, was a dumping place for dead bodies. Those are robbed and killed or faced any unnatural deaths. There are several stories people believe about the house, such as in the night, an old witch roam around the house and eat different organs of, the, of these dead bodies. The man was starving and the storm forced him to go inside the house. There he found the witch slowly moving around from one body to another. The disparate man needed food for living and suddenly became furious on the witch, uh, which he was earlier very afraid of. He decided to attack the witch and did so. As he did that, he came to know that it was not a supernatural witch, rather a poor old woman who was collecting hairs from dead bodies to make false hair to sell in the market. So are the grassroots agents of social media rumors nowadays. As part of the social media pop culture, they disseminate messages mostly from the dominant discourses, looking for trendy positions, clickable headlines, juicy contents, and so on. Sometimes you hear from them the voice of the government, sometimes of the mass, sometimes of the police. police. But all are primarily to monetize and then rarely to politicize, but not in a manner that will feed the idea of resistance. Facebook comes to them as the rainforest for hunting and gathering, riots, rapes, and scandals are all big fishes to catch. Their identities are purely performative, depending on the cultural economy of the rumor. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you for the extra time. All right. Thank you so much, Shumon. That was a very, very interesting presentation about rumors, their weaponization, social media and surveillance, and how subversive forms of resistance goes on despite all of that. Um, all right. So the next we have um, uh, Harisur Rahman. Uh, his uh, presentation is titled Mindless Propaganda or Thoughtful Persuasion, the Convergence of Television, Commercial and Popular Culture in Bangladesh. Uh, Harisur is an uh, assistant professor at the Department of Political Science and Sociology at North South University in Dhaka, Bangladesh. He also coordinates NSU TV, Radio and Digital Lab and China's South Asia Center for uh, Sociocultural Studies. He obtained his PhD in anthropology from the University of Auckland in New Zealand in 2016. His book, Consuming Cultural Hegemony, uh, Bollywood in Bangladesh was published in 2019. Over to you, Harisur. Uh, thank you, Ahana, uh, for your kind introduction. Uh, thank you very much, uh, everyone, uh, for participating in this seminar and webinar and listening to my presentation. Uh, as you've heard that uh, the title of my research, so how many minutes, sorry, I have like 17. You have 15 minutes. Oh, 15 minutes, thank you, it's a race against time. So, <laughs> Uh, 
So, uh, as you know, that in uh, Bangladesh, uh, you know, with the advent of uh, new liberal uh, policy, like in the 1990s, uh, the whole South Asian uh, subcontinent, and, uh, you know, the advent of satellite TV channel, we are uh, bombarded with a lot of television channels, also with a lot of advertisement that came from India mainly. And we are, uh, you know, we got familiar with Indian channel before we had, uh, had our own TV channels, except like UTV, street run uh, television. So uh, multinational uh, companies came into Bangladesh, and, uh, I mean, a long back, but after new liberalization that it, it came in numbers and, you know, uh, the advertisement uh, were like on the rife and uh, audience are very much captive. Uh, uh, they had no, like, there are not that much internet uh, at that time, so it was all uh, television that was the, you know, windows that uh, showcasing that advertisement to the audience, to the consumer. And uh, as you know, uh, in uh, 30th September 2021, most of the Indian TV ads uh, actually were brought until uh, 30 September, Indian uh, TV channels are available in Bangladesh with advertisements. Uh, but the recent phenomenon of like clean feed drive uh, against uh, Indian channel actually blackout uh, or block many Indian channels to be shown in Bangladesh. So uh, within this time frame, actually, like over the last uh, 30 years or so, uh, we have a long uh, history of advertisement. Like uh, we always complain that our television channels provide a lot of ads, you know, which is too loud, and, and the timing of advertisement is crazy, and the and the quality of that is like uh, horrible in a sense. So uh, I was wondering to research on, on this subject because I also have a background of working one of the uh, production houses, uh, media production houses in Bangladesh, who produces ads. So I was in research. Uh, I carried a research for two years there. So the objective is to understand uh, how the production and cultural values uh, uh, make a TBC popular or unpopular. Also, uh, and to analyze the various types of messages and meaning TBC conveyed to the audience. So uh, there are a handful of uh, literature on that. Uh, uh, Alom actually did his PhD recently uh, from the States and he uh, found that there is a tendency of uh, producing moral youth consumer or uh, you know targeting moral youth consumer in that his finding uh, represent the cause of animosity and everlasting dilemma amongst Bangladeshis religiously identity colliding with ethnic identity uh, he explains that Islamic identity was on the background whereas Bangladeshi identity occupied the foreground during the liberation war uh, and, and currently challenged by the rising middle class and another work by Islam, uh, she analyzed uh, Bangladeshi advertisements uh, governed by nationalistic discourse. And the nationalistic uh, consciousness is composed through language and sustained through capitalism. Overall, the newspaper advertisement, here she actually worked on newspaper advertisement. She found that uh, the advertisement shifted from uh, illustrating uh, the nationalistic spirit to adulterated consumer centric nationalism since independent. Uh, and, uh, it led to the capitalization of the Cheton of war or freedom through the aggressive emphasis of commodity and promotion of the consumer society. So if we uh, get to the neighboring country, we'll see that there are also uh, a lot of works, but I uh, you know, would like to highlight a couple of works. In India, uh, Chaktopadda examined the role of television commercial in the first changing economic life in India. What he found, the continuity of the past affected the present and the resulted in a system where the new is presented as old and foreign as India. Majorella, uh, 2003, uh, he actually situated consumption with commercial uh, disciplinary uh, political and subversive practices that shape uh, social discourse. He stated that globalism causes ambivalence. At the same time, it provides advertisers with a chance of, uh, to revitalize Indianness, since Indian diversity withstands any homogenization force, be it cola, uh, cola work, Coca-Cola versus Pepsi, and McDonaldization. So uh, to talk about methodology, uh, actually, I carried out uh, qualitative interviews. Uh, and also, uh, I analyzed uh, 36 TBC using uh, uh, rhetorical analysis and multimodal discourse analysis. To talk about commercial culture uh, as popular culture, 
So uh, commercial culture is a process that there are many definitions about like, you know, popular culture and commercial culture. So I have uh, picked a couple. Commercial culture is a process that specifically refers to the creation of the relation between audience and advertisers. And popular culture uh, is like, uh, entertainment that is produced by culture industry composed of symbolic content mediated widely and consumed with pleasure. So uh, ad itself is like a matter of consumption. I mean, a product they promote, but ad itself, the content, it's a narrative, it's a story. So we also consume the ad itself. And advertisers, uh, they sponsor different uh, popular culture like film or uh, television program or news. Uh, uh, so that also become kind of consumer uh, goods in a sense, uh, according to Fowlis. So uh, for analysis, I used uh, Aristotle's rhetorical triangle uh, to analyze TBC. So what I found that Aristotle said, if you want to make your voice heard, you need to have at least three qualities, which is known as ethos, pathos, and logos. So advertisers uh, in Bangladesh mostly use, uh, you know, emotion. They provoke emotion with pathos. Uh, also, they use bankable actors to create credibility, but you'll find hardly any logic. And uh, what is prominent here is the tradition they invent, which is very uh, recent in a sense. Uh, all uh, tradition that uh, is defined is always recent, I mean, with present that we compare with the tradition, like which is known to be very fast according to Osborne, Hobsbawm, and others. Like uh, this Ayush, Liber Ayush ad, it was uh, mentioned that 5,000 years back, uh, like the Ayurveda, which is uh, in the different references, 3,000 years back, but they uh, romanticized it 5,000 years back. And uh, uh, they uh, connected with their, uh, you know, theory of like human liver, they connected with uh, uh, Ayurveda medicine and all that. But uh, they try to reinvent that uh, the uh, medicine and you know that type of uh, ingredients and they have uh, produced their commodities and they uh, portray that present that which is like with the bankable actors as you can see so uh, we also need to know that there are like you know text and picture they create meaning construct reality maintain social relations and uh, we know from very many semioticians, uh, the of art, uh, one of them is like rhetoric of image through anchorage and relay how, you know, labeling of any image can produce meaning and how they uh, interact with each other with image and, uh, you know, uh, uh, text. Also, studium and punctum. Uh, studium is like very basic or what is visible to all or, or, or the grammar or picture, but punctum is very subjective. We, we, we decipher the meaning. Uh, like the a picture on the top without any, uh, you know, it, 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 it shows, uh, uh, you know, we can interpret it through very many ways, but when we peg it with any wording that actually fix the meaning. There is also like nonverbal communication, like the picture editing or presentation, uh, a, a, you know, a camera angle that also creates meaning, like low angle, uh, you know, can be very empowering pose or high angle uh, looking down. So uh, it creates meaning, it, it creates uh, signifier uh, all the way. Also, there is a special meaning of any, uh, uh, I mean, uh, picture that Luen and Chris uh, mentioned. So we know that we are living in such a time where everything is spectacle. And according to Guy Debor, uh, it's like uh, all that was once directly lived has become mere representation. Images have supplanted a genuine human interaction. So uh, according to uh, Arthur Aschaberger, it's like bourgeois capitalist society, uh, we live in always in psychological terror. Like the terror raised by the ads may include growing old in a youth race culture, being fat in a thin race culture, being a dark skinned per person in a fairness race culture, being poor in a wealthy obsessed culture, being a woman in a male dominated culture. An individual is always being told and shown that he or she is suffering from deprivation and sense of loss and so on. So, <clears throat> Uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, we, we can see the, the cultural value of uh, an advertisement, how it actually uh, works. So, uh, you know, any product, like any international product that comes to any uh, local country and they use local culture and, and, and they relate it with, to create sign values, social relations, cultural values they, they, they use. And uh, 
uh, you know, adds, isolate, fetishize, commodify, personify body parts, and uh, they reify uh, human relations, social relations to create balance. If you see this ad, like uh, Barger Paints, like they celebrated 25 years of uh, Barger Paints, like, you know, they uh, provided the ad, like uh, here you can see the top picture, Barger Paints, 25 years back. It shows that family relations, like previously it showed nuclear family, but uh, with the romanticization they so, show now, it's, it's very nuclear family. After 25 years with their, uh, you know, they, they got united, the couple. Uh, with their uh, children and other family members. So it, it provokes kind of emotion, like with the rhetorical triangle, I told you that uh, ads are very much emotionally provoked and it creates, uh, you know, nostalgia with, uh, or, or, or memory that uh, is based on that. And they sell their product on that. So we've, uh, I found different, uh, uh, you know, themes on like how different types of values are uh, actually created in advertisement. It's like modern values that nuclear family individualism, traditional values, extended family, uh, nationalism, patriotism, filial piety and all that hybrid both of uh, modern and traditional values advertisement creates in Bangladesh and symbolic values, you know, it could be social, economic, cultural, utilitarian and hedonistic value that that creates. Another ad I'd like to uh, shed light on like the Coca-Cola, Bangla Now and Bangla Then TBC. It was actually banned by the High Court that Coca-Cola uh, has distorted Bangla words through its campaign, say the High Court. Uh, High Court said Bangla words uh, printed on the label of Coca-Cola bottles were offensive and designed to Bengali language. Uh, so as you can see, the words that Coca-Cola revived, tried to revive, like 5,000 words, uh, they actually tried to revive it, putting on its bottle instead of like, you know, showing Coca-Cola, they are showing this Austin, Babu, Matanosto, Para, and all of that. So it created a lot of hype in the society. And, and, and there was like a lot of uh, in the society, like they're actually, uh, you know, uh, promoting kind of digital, I, I mean, Jesus culture or something very, uh, uh, you know, dumbed down culture, which uh, is not a standard for uh, urban middle class and so on and so forth. So if you see the new meaning of Papur, it's talking tall, but the old meaning is like very troublesome or problem. Uh, uh, Mathanashto is now is very positive, overwhelmed, but previously it was known to be mentally unstable and all that. Babu is very famous. There are a lot of songs on that as well. So it's like Adore Tak or call someone with care. But previously it was used by the colonizers or uh, the Hindu, Jamidar and educated male. Para is excessive travel, but you know, that paragraph we sometimes will say. Oh, Hi, sir, you have one minute to wrap up. Okay. So the thing is, the question is, uh, why did Coca-Cola choose a specific words to revive? And how does language change? So we know language change because of very many reasons. I'm not getting into that. Uh, and also we have found that uh, in 2020, uh, the advent of COVID-19, uh, almost, almost all the products of the advertisements were converted into, or COVIDized, you know, they used COVID, even the Radhuni Spice, they also used COVID as like, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, they, they were serving food uh, to the needies with the CSR campaign, but uh, they somehow or the other, they, uh, you know, uh, brought COVID discourse within their spices, which has nothing to do with uh, COVID. And uh, toothpaste, toilet cleaner, you know, uh, or, or, or malted drinks like Horlicks, uh, they're all, uh, uh, you know, bringing that COVID discourse into their advertisement, like to uh, exploit on social fear or panic, moral panic. So the last is like, I also, you know, took interview uh, from the audience. And what I found the audience is like very much exasperated with the fact that uh, the ad frequency, timing and loudness is very much uh, bothering them. The street typing uh, are targeting certain class. Uh, they're like, you know, Bangladeshi had very much jingle-based family relations and, you know, very stereotypical, but Indian ads are very catchy with the humor as they told. Uh, and the racism also there. So, <clears throat> uh, all in all, the effects of TBC have on us. Uh, the last uh, slide is like, uh, you know, every individual has its, his or her agency, but uh, I'm wrapping it up. 
but when we it goes uh, with the structure like media it comes with like any children uh, can learn about racism before it can, uh, he, he or she can like uh, talk so uh, whenever you see like uh, advertisement like fair and lovely which is known as blue and lovely and uh, children uh, automatically in uh, their head that strikes that you know uh, white is beautiful and all that so uh, at the end of the day uh, add effects like a lot of uh, effects that uh, add actually have on us which is mostly negative in many sense it can uh, create racism that uh, creates and sexism stereotypes and all that you know so thank you very much for your patience it was racing us time all right. Thank you so much, Haris. That was very good. I'm, uh, it was very interesting about the TV season propaganda and how meaning is made through different uh, audiovisual means. Uh, I will move quickly to our next presenter. Um, Fahmida Akhtar is an associate professor of drama and dramatics at Jahangir University, Bangladesh. She holds a PhD in film studies from the University of Essex, UK, having received a Commonwealth scholarship. She authored a numerous research articles on Bangladeshi cinema. She's the author of Alamgir Kobir Cholochitro, uh, the films of Alamgir Kobir. Uh, Bangladesh Film Archive 2019. She has also directed several documentary films. Her um, presentation is titled Women Filmmakers in Bangladesh, Exploring Women's Authorship Opportunities and Obstacles in Filmmaking. Over to you, uh, Fahmida. Thank you, Hannah, for your nice introduction. And I'd like to thank the organizers uh, for organizing such a scholarly event. And I feel um, lucky to be a part of uh, this uh, conference. Uh, let me share my uh, slides. Okay. So, am I allowed to share? Yes, you, you should be able to share. You're a co-host, right, Lily? Uh, yeah. Okay. Oh. You should be able to share. Okay. Oh, there it is. Is it visible? Yes, it visible? yes, we okay. can see it now. So as you heard that uh, the title of my paper is uh, Women Filmmakers in Bangladesh Exploring Women's Authorship Opportunities and Obstacles in Filmmaking. Like slide is changing? Uh, it's, okay. Yeah, it changed, it changed just now. Yeah. Uh, okay, okay. So like other sectors in Bangladesh, the film industry is also male dominated and male controlled does it mean that the film industry of Bangladesh is empty of women? This is not the case. Women are there, but <clears throat> in front of camera as actresses, the presence of women in film direction, a profession that is subject to hard work requiring both artistic and technical knowledge is truly very poor in number. The constitution of Bangladesh is a constitution to ensure equality between men and women an independent film, uh, independent ministry of women was set up in the country in 1986 to ensure the overall development of women despite the constitutional provisions to ensure equal rights uh, for men and women in almost all cases and the various or ongoing development activities aimed at establishing gender equality by various international organizations. The number of film directors in Bangladesh is very insufficient. <clears throat> women's perspective and experience must be included in film, which is a popular medium with a wide range of influences on masses when women come forward to make films. In those films, the lives they portray, in many cases, their experiences and aesthetic sense can be reflected. But the traditional creation of women that we perceive in <clears throat> uh, literature and uh, films and different art are mostly man-made. The construction of the male creators cannot be entirely genuine 
in depicting the hopes and aspirations of real women. That is why the film medium needs to present women's voices, perspective, experiences, problems, crises, dreams, sense of life. In Bangladesh, research of serious writings on the statistical list of women directors, their filmmaking experiences, both by the government and by any private institution, are rare. <laughs> In this paper, I will endeavor to explore the statistical data of women directors, their backgrounds, positions in the film industry and their filmmaking experiences, obstacle, expectations. Although the title gives the hint to discuss women's authorship, I'm afraid that in uh, 10 to 20 minutes time of my presentation, I would not be able to discuss the authorship of all the women filmmakers. Thus, I will briefly discuss the tendencies of their films. In addition, one of the objective of the paper is to explore the required steps towards creating a women-friendly fil filmmaking environment. Okay. It is very important questions. A question, how many women filmmakers are in Bangladesh? To find the answer to this question, I will, uh, we need to first figure out the number of films released in Bangladesh. From various sources, uh, such as a book by Mirja Tarikul Kadir, Unupum Hayat, and from the web page of Bangladesh Film Censor Board, I make an effort to count the number of the released films in Bangladesh following the independence. These are approximately 3,000. Among these films, the films directed by women filmmakers are very poor in number. There are nearly 20 filmmakers whose films belong to the mainstream film industry. Independently, nearly 30 to 40 women make films. In Bangladesh, many independent women filmmakers, they do not go through the censorship procedure as they screen their films in alternative outlets. Considering this, in it is difficult to count their numbers. At the same time, mainstream media have the apathetic tendency to discuss and cover women's films. Consequently, it is not easy to collect information relating to their screenings or making related materials. Okay, uh, let me present two tables on women filmmakers in Bangladesh over the past 10 years. Uh, table one, with the uh, number of the films by men and women filmmakers in Bangladesh from 2011 to 2002. Uh, and the second slide and the second table, uh, with the number of the yearly basis films by men and women filmmakers in Bangladesh from 2011 to 2020. So, in the first table, let's go back to the first table. In the first table, we see that in the last 10 years, from two, um, 2011 to 2020, women filmmakers are representing only 3.61% of the total number of the films. In other countries of the world, the number of women filmmakers is um, relatively less than other professions. However, despite this, the number of women directors in Bangladesh is less than most of the countries. In 2020, Choitali Shamaddar has done a research on the participation of women in technical fields of filmmaking. In her research, it was mentioned that there was no women editor, cinematographer, or sound recordist working in uh, BFDC, Bangladesh Film Development Corporation, which is a government-run autonomous institution. There is also the main, or this is also the main and oldest film studio of Bangladesh. However, the participation of women in different technical fields in the television industry is visible and increasing. But the film industry is strongly male dominated and male controlled. In such context, the number of Bangladeshi women filmmakers that we see uh, in the last two slides uh, are not actually that much frustrating. So, <clears throat> the emergence in the context of Bangladeshi women filmmakers. The landmark event of women in film direction took place in 1970 by the film Bindu Theke Britto by Rebecca. The year 1970 was an important year for Bangladeshi cinema. This is the year we see the reflection of strong sense of nationalism on cinematic screen. So the context played an important role in appearing a female film director. However, following the independence of Bangladesh, 
we see a big vacuum. It took nearly 15 years for a woman to appear as a film director. Rosie Afsari is the first woman filmmaker in independent Bangladesh. She made a, uh, her uh, first film, first and only one film, Asha Niresha, was made in 1986. Her long career as a film actress helped her to be a director. Moreover, her first husband, Abdul Samad, was an acclaimed and trained film director and cinematographer. Her second husband, Malik Afsari, is also a popular film director from mainstream industry. So, along with her long experience in film acting, she had the opportunity to know more about films, uh, technical aspects, which helped her to be a film director. Later, like Rosie Afsari, a few film actresses came forward in filmmaking. Here, I'd like to show you a slide revealing the background of the women filmmakers. As I said earlier, initially women uh, came from uh, with their film acting career, uh, and some were involved in short film movement. They received the knowledge of world cinema by regular film screening and had participated in different film appreciation courses. And in 1990s, in collaboration with different NGOs and having funding from the many um, and funding from the NGOs, many women started making films, particularly documentary films. Some women started making films after returning from abroad following having training or higher studies in different areas in filmmaking. From early 2000, after the initi initiation of private TV channels in Bangladesh, some women had the opportunities to, to work in the TV productions. Some of them later started making films. In recent time, with having different lengths of filmmaking trainings and academic degrees from uh, within the country, women are emerging as directors. A very few women filmmakers started making films owing to their strong passion in films or by being obliged to depict important issues of women or relating to women. I prepared two lists of women filmmakers, both from mainstream and alternative films. Uh, here is the list of uh, prominent uh, mainstream women filmmakers. In mainstream films, film, um, film, female directors have mostly made women-oriented films, giving women central position, but they could not often avoid the traditional techniques of commercial films in representing women. In fact, they have sometimes had to surrender to the capital. Here is another slide for the mainstream women filmmaker. Mainstream women filmmaker have mostly made fictional films. They are less interested in making documentaries. These films are often with song and dance sequences following the formula of Bollywood movies. Mostly studio-based plot lines are primarily tri-dimensional and goal-driven with hero-villain conflicts, melodic with happy endings. And let's present the list of <laughs> women working in, in, uh, independently. Alternative women film directors are independent. In Bangladesh, the practices of independent films started um, as a movement during the uh, mid 1980s, known as the short film movement. However, not all the independent women film directors uh, in Bangladesh are involved in this moon movement. Some of them endeavor to make experimental films. Uh, in most cases, they are more inclined towards making documentaries. Again, they also make fictional films, avoiding the conventions of commercial films. In many cases, they cast unknown actors, actresses. They go outside the studio setup, their lower budget, and aesthetic sense both have worked in this case. They often themselves are taking their films to the various film festival, history, tradition, contemporary issues, deprivation, uh, oppression against women are gradually emerging <coughs> um, as the subjects of their film. <coughs> At the same time, they're also dealing with various important issues in establishing women rights in their films. Some women filmmakers can fit in the both groups, such as Rubaiyat Hussain. Okay. <clears throat> so now I would like to <clears throat> uh, uh, 
uh, tell about the <coughs> obstacle of for women in uh, they are facing in filmmaking gendered bias funding whether it is fictional film or document documentary film a female directors uh, director tells her story differently and the male members are not accustomed with such diff, um, different style of storytelling from ages the story Amida, telling... you have one minute for wrap up oh really, <laughs> yeah, really. Uh, oh, okay so i have shown here the um, obstacles for women and uh, funding actually is the main problem for them and uh, the producers are not inclined to go beyond the contested and traditional techniques made by men in most cases they don't trust in the approaches of women filmmakers which are often new to them so in filmmaking the main obstacle that women face is the lack of fun however women filmmakers in mainstream industry are not are, are more powerful than the independent women filmmakers in this regard as most of them have a long decent history of working in the industry as actresses they can manage easily producers uh, than the independent filmmakers the male dominated working environment women usually work with the lower budget than main uh, directors due to their comparatively poor budget their set arrangements and workforce in the shooting unit are different than the male directors this difference sometimes affect in the attitude of the actress actress and the technician towards women film director moreover in the highly patriarchal society like bangladesh women are seen more in the role of providing assistance rather than in the role of leadership thus many women filmmakers in bangladesh finds it difficult to direct uh, or having full command to the unit women's authorship are um, challenged sometimes women filmmakers have been punished of them uh, for breaking the traditional discourse in this regard i can mention the film meherjan by rubaiyat hussain following its release in 2011 it was withdrawn by the distributor as it was ac accused of distorting history this acquisition was made by small number of intellectual not by all not by the audience here we note that when a film director want to represent history from a different perspective it was not accepted by all on the other hand in bangladeshi film history it was evident that many male directors employed rape sequences of bangladeshi women in several war films with a commercial purpose the type of representation by male director was not attacked in this way however meherjan has been widely received in many international festival despite being rejected in bangladesh and <laughs> women authorship uh, the male dominating culture of our society sometimes doesn't want to acknowledge even the authorship of women film director it was there from the very beginning i need to mention here one incident that uh, the critics initially do not want to admit that the film bindu theke brittu was done by rebecca herself in a short piece published in daily ittefaq in 1970 chinmoy mutshuddi credited kokru lalon the producer of the film as the director of this film instead of Rebecca. Uh, so, <laughs> um, and I had uh, prepared some, um, some. You can finish your thought. <laughs> uh, anyway, it is very long, uh, the suggestion for overcoming the obstacle for women filmmakers. But I'd like to say, uh, lastly, that societal view of filmmaking, the main obstacle also, um, uh, one of the main obstacles, uh, the conventional attitude of the society. Still, today, women's involvement in film is not accepted by the society warmly. Society, co society calls Cholochitra line nama, which means getting down with the film line when a person, particularly female, gets involved with films. This attitude shows that the profession is still regarded as an amenable one. And in this context, women in filmmaking profession that requires leadership and hard work didn't receive due respect or recognition. Um, I have uh, sorry, <laughs> uh, I took uh, my more than oh, no, it's fine, I it's fine, don't I, worry I, about I, it. We're, you're good. <laughs> if you want to finish another thought, please go ahead and finish um, it. That's fine. I actually, I actually made several um, suggestions how to overcome the situation. Anyway, it's a long list. 
So uh, I think uh, when I'll publish this paper, I'll write there. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, and maybe we can also talk about it during the exchanges that we have. You can talk about those suggestions that you uh, okay. have in your paper. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, thank you so much, Farmida, and thank you. That's a very important uh, presentation about women filmmakers and kind of the structural barriers that uh, they face in Bangladesh. Um, so we will go on to our next uh, presentation, uh, which is by Dr. Nas Nasrin Khandokar. Um, uh, Dr. Nasrin Khandokar is an associate professor at the Department of Anthropology in Jahangirnagar University. She's also a postdoctoral fellow at the National University of Ireland in Galway. In addition to a master's degree from the Department of Anthropology in Jahangirnagar University, she was awarded an MA in Gender Studies from Central European University in Hungary. She received a Wenergren Wadsworth uh, Fellowship from the US and the John and Pat Hume Scholarship from Manus University, uh, Ireland in, for her PhD. Uh, and her uh, presentation is titled Authenticity and its Creative Subversion, a Bangla Folk Songs in the Margin. Over to you, Nasreen. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'll be very brief and I will just jump into the presentation without saying much. Uh, uh, so this paper um, is, so everyone is uh, capable of uh, seeing my screen? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we can see it. Yeah. So uh, this paper is from one of the chapters of my PhD thesis. Um, the empirical data I used here came from my field work and also from my upbringing as a member of the middle-class Bengali woman in the suburban of Dhaka. Um, so uh, being, uh, being a researcher and a subject of my research are uh, therefore entangled in my subjectivity. Searching for authentic folk songs as the true essence of the Bengali nationalist spirit driven by the interest to build Bangladesh as a nation state, as already Harris mentioned here, that tradition uh, is um, um, usually about the present day. So that's how we see that making the Bang Bengali nation um, tradition has been invented this way. And also the our authentic uh, folk song um, and it is searching. So at, as part of the search, the nation state and market manipulate and negotiate with popular beliefs aesthetic demands and the longing for cultural religious identities. These manipulations and negotiations uh, complicate the debate on what constitute authentic folk tradition. Today, I will discuss the interrelation and the dilemma between these political, religious, corporate and cultural factors that created the rise of folk in the musical scenario after the independence of Bangladesh and in particular during the last three decades. These fields are constructed by numerous overlapping agents and interests. Um, the search for authentic folk songs is central to these stakeholders, but situated very differently, serving different purposes. With this perspective, I analyzed five different agents of authenticity in contemporary Bangla folk musical scene. However, it is only for the purpose of analysis I'm aware of the fact that this categorization is reductive and entangled with numerous heterogeneous agents. So the first, um, the, the, the first claimant of authenticating authority of folk songs is hot, what uh, Lotte Hark uh, calls the uh, aesthetic project of vernacular elite. Uh, as the most influential authority for uh, Bangaliness, uh, Rabindranath Thakur introduced the positive image of Baul as the true essence of Bangla folk traditions, but he avoided the heterodox deviant aspects of Baul regarding body imagery and sexuality, and instead focused on the spirituality of the songs from a humanist point of view like himself. Following Tagorean influence, this authenticating elites picked up Baul and constructed it from modernist perspectives, focusing on their superiority from many other folk genres and traditions. And the second authority to authenticate and influence folk songs is the culture of religious morality. While the Bengali nationalist aesthetic project had been the most uh, dominant in that sphere for a long time, 
Abbasuddin Ahmed and his legacy is crucial to the Bangla folk song traditions. From a moral Islamic perspective, Baals are con considered deviant and they try to put forward the other folk song traditions like Bhatiyali and Bhawaya instead Baal, but excludes the apparently vulgar words uh, and songs from them as well. However, with a careful analysis, it can be easily seen, and as Joya Chatterjee argues, that Bengali nationalist and Islamic morality are not really the opposite positions the way the dominant political discourse in Bangladesh depicts. In historically, even in the political sphere, um, they worked hand in hand in Bangladesh. The current political sphere is thus a complex wave of power relations constructed through negotiation and bargaining with Islamic sentiment, communalism, and nationalist political agendas. In this way, Bangla folk songs are used as the essence of Bangladesh for these moral authorities, but at the same time are often accused of immorality and subject to a kind of scrutiny and purification that is similar to the aesthetic authority of ba Bengali nationalism. Uh, the third trend uh, in the authenticity debate is about alternative folk songs, namely folk fusion. In particular, with the rise of neoliberal forces from 80s and 90s, influenced by a culture of resistance, a new generation of youth developed a distrust in both to the Islamic versus secular Bengali aesthetic projects. Having rejected both, an interest rose in Western influenced pop or rock band music scene. However, Western influence was not enough to provide a sense of belonging for that generation. From this identity crisis of 90s generation, the young urban band singers and their searching for soul created new connections to the folk tunes. Many bands and musicians turned their attention to folk tunes as they needed to rely on their own alternative cultural icons to construct their ideological belonging within Bengali culture. I can see it as a counter-hegemonic trend to resist purifications of dominant authenticating authorities of folk music. Here I can give examples of music musicians like Arubrahi, Anushe, Anadil, Maksudul Haq, and Ban Lalon from many. In parallel uh, to these three stakeholders, the rise of an apparent unsophisticated folk song trends by the marginalized singers and producers pose a challenge to those authenticating authorities through their uh, undeniable expansion of the market. This is the fourth and the biggest influence in Bangla folk song aroused from the margins in the last three decades. Muhammad defines it as urban folk and Choudhury calls it subaltern songs or Nimnobarger Ga. Most of these four singers referred themselves as folk or baul singers, no matter how the musicological analysis would define. They follow the traditional tune associated with folk songs in general, but created, creates the lyrics from their day-to-day -day lives and metaphors. Their authority and belonging towards folk songs is somewhat uh, organic, unlike the authorities of the elite folk musicians who have the power to define what is a folk song and what is not. Marginalized singers uh, produce these songs themselves for the marginalized audiences. Montas Begum, with her enormous popularity, became the representative and the genre-defining icon for this trend. To contextualize this trend from the 90s, there has been a massive flux of female migration caused by the rise of the garments industry. There is a tendency of scholars to see these female workers as either the victims of transnational exploitation or as financially empowered women. Both approaches are inadequate to understand their agency and vulnerability. Inter interestingly, the culture, cultural products they enjoy and the songs they listen to, excuse me, say a lot about their lives, their experience and emotions. The famous song, Porander, uh, sorry. The famous song, Poraner Bandhubre, sung by Kangalini Sufia, parts of the lyrics that I put into the slide, talks about a female worker earns money to please her lover, but even after all of her hard work, she cannot get his love. The day-to-day -day lives and struggles of migrated urban poor women within changing gender and sexual norms 
and the emotions to which they can connect themselves are reflective of the rise of subaltern song. These songs can be the link between the female migrated working class women and the fierce voices and songs of the female singers. The popularity and the songs of Kangalini Sufia dismantling, dismantle the dominant male breadwinner idea of man earning money to impress his wife upholds female workers living experience, anger, and resistance. Similarly, Momtaz Begum as the uh, similarly Momtaz Begum as the cultural icon and her bold songs or the sexual expression of Nargis Akhtar evidently show the defiance of female voices of urban poor. Despite the acute vulner vulnerability and struggle they are living with, the songs can be a vehicle for them to express their sexual agency and anger that is neither possible to be voiced in a normal discussion nor representative of open practices. But the popularity of these songs indicate the existence of that voice, which is not given from the top by the developmental empowerment projects. And um, yeah, and however, the song's popularity and acceptability can be a hint of their resisting emotions and voice. Despite the fact that the Puritan folk song authorities sharply criticized the later two trends, folk fusion is considered a somewhat higher standard for many elite authorities because of the sophisticated composition and recording. On the contrary, urban folk or, or subaltern song follows traditional tune and creates new metaphors of expression of urban lives of the lower class without having sophisticated mu musical instrumental support and standard recording. What is apparently the fifth authenticating authority of folk songs is the nation state and corporate interest and actually a negotiated sphere between all other sources that I, ha that I have mentioned as they are the most potent authenticating institutions. The corporate sponsored folk festivals are examples of nation corporate association. Under the um, umbrella of folk, all genres come together in the large folk festivals. Amongst them, the International Folk Festival is the biggest one, which started from 2015 and is sponsored by a few multinational corporations. The market and its demands didn't only affect the lyrics and tunes of metropolitan folk culture but also the activities of rural poor artists. The technologies and the mobile phone, memory cards, and YouTube also changed the practices of music. The remix of our fusion of folk songs feeds the changing taste and lives of both the upper, upper middle and lower class people. Additionally, the online availability of folk music expanded its market from local to global and it spread the same way through social class. The popularity of the songs for immigrant Bengalis has justified many huge concerts abroad, particularly in Dubai and London, where Mamdas and other folk singers have also performed. In result, the undeniable size of the market for our urban folk became a space of negotiation for its performers and producers. However, as the nation corporate mingle represents all the stakeholders' interest, the marginal folk musicians and singers represented in this sphere are sometimes a form of tokenism in which their elements of de deviant resistance are filtered to match with the status quo. In conclusion, I would like to argue that authentication is linked with power. Not everyone has the authority to say what an authentic tradition is and is not, as it requires power to exclude and include. The marginalized singers who are often considered as the source of authentic folk songs, they are not in a position to say what is the authentic folk music. There is a sharp critique against the folk remix and urban folk singers with the accusation that they pollute the tradition traditional form and morality. By the same time, their undeniably resistant existence creates a discomfort for the authenticating authorities. All of the agents I have mentioned here creates a negotiated sphere between the dominant hegemonic nationalist, nationalist corporate forces 
and the counter-hegemonic force of the subversive popular folk productions. It also creates a space for creativity through fusion, a form of reproduction reflecting the changing taste within different classes. I see that creativity more than the creativity of margins that Vina Das proposed as the other of the state. Instead, I see these for fusion as an assemblage in the sense that Anna Singh used the term as patches of livelihoods come into being where participants come with varied agendas and do their small part in guiding world, make, world making projects. With the promise of existence that Anna Singh sees through assemblages, I hope the folk songs and their resistant existence remain in the ruin of the devastation of neoliberal capitalist forces and create spaces to construct subversive subjectivity with the emotions and desire of the people living in the margin. Thank you very much. I, I think I made it within the time limit. You still have 30 seconds left. Oh, it's okay. Don't worry. <laughs> Very well done with the timing. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, uh, Nasreen. That was a, such an interesting um, uh, presentation about uh, folk songs and the changing political culture of Bangladesh. I'm sure there are all... Oh, I see many hands popping up already. I think I saw a Saima Khatun's uh, hand go up. And then uh, Mahmoudul Shumon and Zirwat Choudhury. So Saima Khatun, uh, we will unmute you and you can ask the question. Um, uh, Lali, can you help with that, unmuting? <clears throat> I've un unmuted Saima Khatun, so she should be able to ask her question. Hey, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for this excellent presentation, Nasrin Khandukar. I did, actually, I didn't have any question. I, just clapped after the presentation. So I may take uh, another chance if I want to question anything later. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank, Thank you, Saima. Um, okay, then we will go to Mahmoudul Shuman. I think he raised his hand. Right, okay. And um, uh, no, uh, Hannah, actually I clapped. Thank oh, you. Oh, okay. okay. Thank you. Okay, then. <laughs> I think I'm seeing this all wrong. I apologize to all of you, but I think Mirza Taslima uh, did raise her hand. Mirza Taslima, okay, sure. Sorry. She, I think Mirza can ask the question. Yes, uh, she's unmuted now. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I, I actually enjoyed uh, uh, this session very much uh, because uh, all the papers are very interesting. Um, I have one question to um, uh, Shimon um, about, uh, uh, he was talking about the journalist, journalist of small magazines. Um, and uh, could you uh, a bit elaborate uh, about how the how the monetization processes take place. Uh, I'm interested about that because uh, you know um, you were talking about uh, um, the uh, the rumors in social media, and it, it is very interesting for me. But uh, I I like to know more about how the monetization processes take place. Uh, actually, want to open up a journal? <laughs> By yourself? <laughs> no, no, not because of that. I'm, I'm, I'm actually uh, doing a research, so that's why I'm, I'm interested. Uh, I, I'm, I'm new in this field, and I, I like to learn from you. Actually, I, I did a research on the peripheral web portals just a, a month ago. It, it was finished now. So, uh, well, that's very interesting because now in every village has a web portal, or at least a, a Facebook page. And the way they actually are earning money is from clicks, Google AdSense, uh, YouTube clicks. So YouTube clicks uh, gives you uh, money and then Google AdSense gives you money. So these are basically, you know, these are global money they're earning from, from the peripheral villages. And well, to do that, you have to be really, you know, capacitated and they don't have any other option but to, you know, recirculate all the juicy contents, you know, uh, rumors, 
so that you know traffic can go on to their pages so this is it actually this is a very simple process they keep their pages rolling all the way 24 7 so that they can earn more clicks more likes more shares you'll see some uh, facebook post on your feed sometimes that you know help posts so in i guess you know my netnographic observation says that at least 70 to 80 percent help help posts are basically fake they're just copying those you know uh, graphic photos from india or sri lanka and they just circulate it recirculate it and sometimes you'll find that and there has been a you know curious uh, kind of call for the audience that you know one like pastaka one share dostaka so which means if you just share it you are donating the boy ten taka so instead of giving the boy directly ten taka you are just sharing it so when you are doing is some virtuous work but what happens? You're not giving the boy ten taka because the boy doesn't exist anywhere. So you are basically helping the site to roll and you know earn more money from Google AdSense or from YouTube. So this is how it works, actually. All right. Thank you, Shumon. Um, uh, next, we'll go to Nazia Hussein. Nazia, I think you have a question. Yes, um, my question is for Nasreen. Thank you for that wonderful presentation. It was very interesting. Um, and thank you for sort of identifying the political nature of you know, authenticating what is art. And on, in your case, obviously, folk music. Um, and this question is entirely based on sort of my personal interests as well. So I was wondering, with your findings, with the political nature and the interplay of power in terms of authenticating what is um, authentication of what is original folk music, I wonder whether in your PhD, because as you said, that's one of your chapters from your PhD, if you kind of looked at um, any sort of um, decolonial thought or, you know, challenges to neoliberal ideas, you know, ideas of modernization, ideas of racial capitalism or racial neoliberalism and how that kind of dictates Southern ideas about their own cultures and art, et cetera. Uh, thank you, Nazia. I think we'll take two more questions. Uh, and then um, while you're preparing your answer, um, Nasreen. So uh, next, I'd like to call on Abdullah Afsan. Can you please uh, unmute? Oh, you are unmuted. Can you just please ask your question? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, I'm an uh, old academic and I enjoyed the papers. I have a question for Shuman Rahman, isn't it? The first speaker? Yes, yes. Shuman Rahman. Uh, you compared the so-called secular pro-Western bloggers and madrasa students blogger. I'm not familiar with the madrasa student bloggers postings, but I am familiar with many of those I mean, pro-Western bloggers. So could you please give some example of uh, madrasa bloggers? And also, it seems that you approve the government's approach now toward the uh, social media platforms like Facebook. If I know the situation correctly, the Bangladeshi authorities, I don't know whether it's the Bangladeshi authorities or the raw in behind, blocked, I mean, totally blocked Mahmoud Rahman's Amar Desh from the site. And three times he tried to get into it, but every time he went, there were uh, complaints to the uh, those who, I mean, provide him with the satellite opportunities. The cases were taken to them and false cases as if he sold his article two times. Although he is making references in his article to events that happened in 2019 
or 2020, uh, but the uh, complaints were raised that those articles were sold 10 years before uh, they were Thank published. you, Abdullah Hassan. I think we yes. uh, get the question. Okay, we thank would you. would like to take a couple of more questions, but I think we uh, got what we're trying to say, right, Shuman? Yes. Um, so I think I'll let you answer that afterwards, but yes, I'll just take on. two more questions. Uh, Rasel Ahmed, please go ahead and um, ask your question. Hi, am I audible? Yes. I'm not going to turn on my video because I look horrible. <laughs> <laughs> So my question is to Nasreen, uh, really a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. Um, I was actually intrigued by um, uh, uh, the slide where you put uh, uh, Momtaz and the song Local Bus, and you define it as, uh, 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 as modern folk. So I really want to, I mean, I'm curious to learn about, you know, how do you define folk? Is this a phenomena? Is this a tradition? Or, or like epistemological, what is like your epistemological argument about like folk, uh, just the definition of folk. And the other thing is like, you know, the reason why I was intrigued because Montas is known as one of the person who have produced this Molik song, like, like which is like her own, so like she's, she's writing her song, songs, she's composing uh, those songs. And this uh, local bus is also, I guess, like co-composed by Pitom Hassan, who is also like a new phenomena using the tradition of folk in Bangladesh and re-emerging some of this music. And so or like coming, coming up, like they are coming with uh, new lyrics like Molik Gan, but at the same time, like this idea of folk is there, right? So how do you see that kind of authorship in your argument of um, uh, like uh, what's, what's genuine, you know, like what is Molik, you know, how do you, how do you present that? How, how, where is that in your argument? This, this concept of Molik. Uh, thank thank you. you so much, Rasil. Uh, we'll just take one last question from Samina Lutfa and then we'll uh, allow the speakers to respond. Uh, Samina, please go ahead. Thank you for giving me another scope. Um, uh, so my first question is to Famida. Uh, I would really want to know the recommendations that she had uh, for uh, for the female uh, directors of Bangladesh, and how to, um, uh, you know, how to get away with the barriers. And the second question is to Shuman Rahman. Uh, I quickly want to know uh, what's his um, what's his take on the government's involvement in creating rumors, if any. All right. Thank you so much, Samina. Uh, I think we'll go first to Nasreen, and then Shuman, and then Famida, if that's okay. All right, um, Nasreen, go ahead. Oh, thank you, thank you so much the, for the uh, Sajia for your brilliant questions. I am, I like it's it's yeah. When you you raise the question about decolonial thoughts, that's the fundamental of my um, research. Uh, I see the because it's one of the chapters, and uh, basically my thesis is about uh, Bhawaiya songs, and it's not really the folk. But then we. There is a problem of definition of what folk, what is Bavaria, what is not, and I realize that the, 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 all those definitions, the way it has been institutionalized, is very problematic. Uh, problematic, and that's why I really want didn't want it to define in one zone. Although I had to focus on that, so is in I think in uh, basically I had three. Um, if I talk about the three uh, uh, theoretical sphere, one is post or decolonial thought, one is feminist neomaterial uh, criticism, and another was a psychological, emotional, affective perspective. So I blended three together. And for decolonial perspective, I, of course, uh, the way we, I conceived the whole idea of Bengali women, constructed it's it comes from the post-colonial critic already so I, I i i endorse all of them and but for me it was even more i wanted to not only deconstruct the colonial knowledge i wanted to reconstruct something new not only in the way uh, uh inventing the tradition that something that was there in the past so we have to not that kind of modernist way but uh something new from contemporary the way we understand so that challenges so um for that i also 
kind of have a decolonial um, uh, de reconstruction of defi definition between the genres, like bhavaya, bawul, bhatiyari. That's also part of my um, thesis. So I would really, um, it's, it's there, uh, it's online fee. So if you if you would like to see that, uh, I, 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 it is fundamentally, uh, I, I, I believe it is a decolonial uh, thought. So um, not, not only anti-racism at the way uh, West, but I, I think in our context, in so, um, South Asian context, I think that's how I, I, I conceive. Second uh, is from Russell. Um, yeah, that's that's very interesting, very, really intriguing question. I do not define. I, I think definition is very, uh, I, I can't define what folk is, what is not. And the uh, thing is, I that's why I, uh, uh, one of the panelists is there, a specialist uh, about um, from his PhD and from his um, monograph, I, I uh, quoted that um, um, Shumon Rahman, he defines as uh, urban folk. And I, def I took the definition and also I took the definition, um, Manush Chaudhary, he was supposed to be present, but he unfortunately he can't. He defined it as subaltern song. And I don't actually, I, what I did, I brought up all the debates of authority, of, uh, uh, sorry, um, authorship. Authorship is very important for folk songs because the way we understand folk, and even, even interestingly, I, I, I showed that, that the def defining folk songs is so difficult that the, the, the biggest um, organization for folk international, biggest international organization for folk um, folk song uh, institution, I can't remember at the moment the name, they had to change it uh, from folk to tradition. I mean, they, they can't use folk anymore because it's became it's so difficult to define what folk is because uh, ideally it was supposed to be the oral tradition. I, ideally it was supposed to be uh, unchangeable, but our contemporary um, uh, neoliberal context do not allow it. Also, there's a question of authorship of the um, uh, raised uh, uh, with, in linked with the um, credit, you know, intellectual property rights. So all of the things really do, do not match with the idea of folk that has invented as a modernist, uh, modernist approach. So I, what I did, I, I, um, I just brought up all the debates together and I do not define but I try to see that different uh, actors, how different actors work and define folk for themselves. That, that was my focus. Thank you so much, Nasreen. Uh, can we go on to Shumon now? Thank you, Hannah. Uh, so before going to the responses that is due on me, as I would like to add something with uh, what Nasrin says about the definition of folk. Since I worked on this field a uh, little earlier, actually, this is really, really a question. And then I would like to remind all of us that, you know, all the bowel songs have the last paragraph, if you can remember, including Lalon to, you know, the most recent ones, that uh, Lalon Bole, so Lalon Bole, Lalon says this. So the re registering the name of the author into the song was a tradition. So in earlier times, it was it was kind of a signature for unknown reasons. But well, it also establishes the bowel individuality, you know, which is very contrary to the folk tradition. In the in the folk tradition, you are no longer an individual. You are an identifiable part of the community, but you know, when in bowel songs, you are seeing, you know, the individual authors are regist uh, you know, registered in their own songs. And one example that I, I would uh, recall right now that, you know, one of the songs uh, was performed by one of the close of one contestants in, in, in a competition where uh, it, was a, it was an urban folk song where the last paragraph contains the name of the, you know, the, the author, the bowl the singer, I forgot the name at this moment. So, uh, well, the final performance, the last paragraph was omitted. The, bow, the, the, the performer took the permission from the author beforehand, but when he saw that the last paragraph, which contains his own name was omitted, he actually went to the court straight away. 
that this is, uh, you know, this is a kind of a, a, a viol violation of my rights. So my name should be there. And, you know, the next, uh, you know, version of the, of the audition, the name has to, uh, had to be included, uh, you know, in, 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 the, uh, in the performance. So that was, that was the question of authenticity and, uh, you know, uh, and claiming authenticity by the Baals which is you know kind of uh, you know very surprising to the whole folk tradition so that is why you know nastin says that this is really uh, very difficult to uh, to define because this is a very you know uh, a, you know very dynamic genre you know often mingling to each other and so on so okay going uh, back to my own responses so thank you abdul Hassan, and you said about uh, you know madrasa background bloggers well uh, blogging is no longer a reality at this moment, but you know I wrote a lot on uh, you know this uh, this fight beforehand, and you know we observed a lot of this uh, generation of bloggers in somewhere in blog and Shachalayaton and Namar blog. No, Shachalayaton did not contain them because it was very ideologically you know regimented blog site, and but other liberal blog sites have plenty of them. And you will see a lot of them, you know, shifted to Facebook later on. And the whole debate, actually, which uh, very unfortunately and ended in, in the violence of, you know, killing of the bloggers, started much earlier in this hot debate uh, between uh, the faith based bloggers and the uh, so called atheist bloggers. So, and it went on. And in this fight, I symbolically wrote uh, from some 10 years back, I guess. In this fight, a lot of pseudonyms, fake, fake IDs were, had to be you know, uh, martyred and sacrificed. Because when you made a derogatory remark with a fake ID, then the blog authority you know, blocks the ID and you come up with another ID. So this was the strategy. And you, know, you see, this, I call the IDs as uh, you know, the infantry of the, of the war. So it was there. Perhaps we did not see them because we live in our own echo chambers. So uh, that's quite natural that we did not see them, but it was there. It was very strongly there. Okay, the second question was about uh, my, uh, my approach that got, well, whether I'm in approval of the government approach towards blocking or not. Uh, well, it might be, well, this paper is still, um, you know, is in in thinking processes. <laughs> so it's not uh, even a written full-fledged paper. But well, what what did I mean actually about you know, the government's initiative or uh, approaches? Is not at all that you know I support the government's initiative, and actually uh, we do fact checking as a third-party fact checker for Facebook and for you know I I have a fact checking site. We do that, but. Things that actually I want to flag that uh, when a riot is going on, I have a very you know uh, volatile experience regarding this Kumila riot. When I had to actually wake up a lot, I mean I I worked uh, eighteen hours a day. I guess I, I remember because you know sometimes some rumors popped up somewhere and instantly became viral. And if you can't stop it right at, at the moment when it started. It will, it will, you know, end up in massacre. So this is something that needs to be stopped. Uh, that is why, I, well, it's not the government actually. It is uh, the corporate uh, Facebook which actually takes the initiative. And the government sometimes supports it, but the go the government is interested about, you know, government has it, its own interest. So it it is more interested in, you know, restoring peaceful situation and of course restoring its own images where uh, well uh, Facebook uh, uh, Facebook and other sites are not very much interested they are interested restoring in their own corporate interest so we people are in the middle so we actually play a kind of a performative identity because sometimes oh, in the situation of a riot when government stands against the riot we support the government but when the government is, you know, legitimately, uh, illegitimately, you know, block uh, a kind of a, demo, uh, a newspaper or a kind of a, a, a person's website, uh, a person's Facebook page, definitely we go against it. And sometimes as, as a fact checker, 
I receive requests from agencies, uh, which are very difficult to you know to uh, you know follow, and we, we do not do that. So this is something that you know sometimes when you don't obey orders. So well, I, my Facebookers are sometimes very frightened. We don't work. We can't work because you know we are being threatened and everything. So, I mean, as a whole, what I'm saying that uh, the government's approach towards social media is not something that can be you know, laudable. But uh, at the same time, when you uh, see a lot of rumors, heinous rumors, mushrooming, violent images are being popped up on your screen, you cannot uh, let it happen at the same time. So you have to, sometimes government will help you, or sometimes government will not. So you have your own conscience to, you know, to posit yourself. So that is what we do. So as a researcher, of course, I'm aside from all of this, I'm just looking at it from an from a, uh, independent point of view. So that's it. I think I was able to answer Samina Lutfa's point too. If not, please let me know. All right, thank you so much, Shumon. And I'll next go to Fahmi Akhtar. Fahmi, and I'm really sorry once again that as a moderator, I had to do the unpleasant thing of cutting you off. I think Samina asked about the um, uh, recommendations that you had. If you want to talk about that now, that would be great. Yes, sure, sure. Uh, <clears throat> uh, actually, this paper is actually ongoing. Uh, but even though I have made several recommendations, uh, which can be uh, revised, uh, first of all, uh, I uh, I would like, uh, I have written that numerous training, both in screenplay writing, cinematography, editing, sound recording, and producing for women should be arranged or organized by the government or non-government uh, funding. And women involved in um, direction and different technical fields, they need to have a strong network. Hmm, they should create strong network so that uh, uh, they can raise their voice for their demands and rights. But in Bangladesh at present, we don't see any network between women filmmakers, whether it is from mainstream film or whether it is from alternative films. Inside and beyond the country for uh, organizing various uh, film festival based on women films, uh, they need to be uh, arranged and we need the emergence of women film distributor or women film exhibitor. But there in Bangladesh, there is no, there are no women uh, distributor or uh, exhibitor. But uh, there is a good news that my one of my uh, students, uh, she is studying now in England. Uh, she is doing a master's on film distribution. So there should be a continuous dialogue between women filmmakers and different important uh, bodies like uh, producer exhibitors and distributors and dialogue should uh, go on between the uh, government uh, bodies like uh, the censorship uh, board and with the policy makers and one important thing that is mentorship program should be launched the collaboration um, the, uh, with the collaboration of the new and old generation filmmakers they can learn they can grow particularly the new filmmakers and women should get uh, uh, special priorities in receiving government funding for filmmaking and uh, at present there is no quota system uh, for funding women in filmmaking uh, so I think a quota system can be run, and we, uh, we know all that how the government uh, funding actually uh, goes in Bangladesh. Uh, sometimes they are accused of <laughs> corruption or shajun uh, priti. Uh, anyway, in the national media like uh, the BTV, there should be a dedicated uh, time slots for broadcasting women films and, uh, and women should get uh, honorarium for this uh, broadcast, a special slot broadcast. And uh, 
uh, frequent competition uh, for uh, or the recognition both uh, for women filmmakers in fiction or documentary films should be arranged uh, by various bodies. And the most important thing is the grassroots level. In the grassroots level, the poor and minority women, uh, sh they need to be trained. Uh, they need to be trained uh, how to handle the camera or, or they need to learn the filmmaking procedure. And in this way, they could they could be motivated to capture the reality of the surroundings and uh, and participation of women in filmmaking across different classes uh, or ethnicity uh, need to be ensured. And uh, I don't know who will do this. Uh, uh, and I, I expect the government should do this. Uh, because women feel um, filmmaking actually is, it requires a lot of money and it requires technical knowledge and women filmmakers they should also uh, get smooth access to ott platforms uh, with a uh, reasonable rate and uh, <clears throat> finally i think that uh, the male colleagues uh, or who are working in the industry they need to be uh, trained with uh, the workshop and um, that that uh, aiming at uh, uh, creating or awareness on gender sensitivity and yeah that's that's the and women should have the bank loan uh, with less interest uh, in making film yeah these are the uh, recommendations i just uh, prepared for now yeah, as i said earlier it can be revised uh, since I'm still writing the paper. All right, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Ramida. I, I'm glad you were able to talk about those recommendations. Very important, uh, definitely. Uh, we have gone over time, but I think we can go on for a few more minutes for people who still want to stick around. This is such a very exciting conversation, very good questions and very good engagement. So uh, on that note, I will next go to Said Ferdos. Uh, you have a question, please go ahead. Yeah, um, uh, thanks to all the speakers of this session. It was a very vibrant session and the papers were very interesting. Uh, Haris, I really like your presentation. Uh, just one uh, curiosity. I'm not uh, in the field of uh, like uh, uh, pop culture studies or like that. So I'm not uh, someone who knows about cultural studies or anything. Uh, the, uh, I'm curious, uh, you used in a title that mindless propaganda so uh, has the commercial ever pursued for mindless propaganda ever or always there was this uh thoughtful persuasion that i am curious about that this is for Thank you. and uh, i have another one for shuman should i uh, do that uh, for shuman mm -hmm. rahman yeah, yeah go ahead okay uh, shuman uh, I was just wondering, like, in your long answer, in your long uh, response uh, to the questions from the floor, you have mentioned about government and government agency. I was just curious uh, about the selection of your topic, like uh, pop culture, a, a demonic term of pop culture, demonic turn of uh, pop culture. I was wondering, like, whether in a particular type of uh, regime and a particular type of uh, relations of ruling and it, it's not particular in Bangladesh it's globally the relations of ruling is working in a different way when media pop culture is often entangled with the governance so at that point what is the role of like troll armies what is the role of the uh, government machines uh, like, uh, machineries that are actually contributed uh, contributing in the role of uh, in, in contributing in producing the uh, rumors and propaganda. So that's, I'm curious to know about that. Yeah, Haris. Thank you, Saeed. Uh, we'll go to Haris first. Thank you, sir, uh, for your good question. Uh, uh, actually, <clears throat> uh, I entitled that with the mindless propaganda, uh, you know, thinking that, that, you know, you know that in Bangladesh, uh, TBC, like it goes on and on. Uh, any news uh, that is sponsored by certain any news headlines that it goes on and on, right? So, 
uh, there is no uh, uh, you know there is no policy i mean there, there there is a policy of what, what are the contents that are that are like reservations if you show that then ad would be banned but there is no implementation and also there is no uh, like uh, you know uh, overseeing uh, uh, like uh, what's we call it like any uh, uh, regulations like from institution or institutional regulation or government regulation <laughs> so, so oh, sorry. what uh, I, I i said that uh, because of that uh, lackluster attitude like we have been in different countries in the west like uh, how many times they can give an ad like in one hour in bangladesh you will find like more than 30 minutes ads are being uh, uh, shown so you, you you will find that uh, you know uh, the drama or, or news is like missing from the whole uh, you know bombardment of ad also the fact is like uh, but they are mindless in a sense that they do not bother about like the sensitivity of children. They just you know use them. They sell chocolate, but they use Lego and other things, which is very much like alluring for them. So who will build the cat for this type of like you know pandemonium situation that in our country the like advertisers they can show anything like think about our leaks taller, stronger, sharper, that ad was like banned in England. Like just, you know, they showed that just one day and they had to give undertaking that they would not show that because it's a damn lying. So in our country, South Asia, they can show anything. And they just, you know, make profit, uh, you know, out of like social uh, value they create, like, you know, of, of whiteness or fairness or glowing or whatever we call it. Uh, you know, there is like social purchase and media exploit that and media create that uh, values and we buy that and we get uh, 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 very much, uh, I would say, allured by that majority uh, of like, you know, people in a sense. And there is no, uh, I mean, social uh, uh, awareness on that, like who will streamline the ad, ad, ad makers or ad givers or even the uh, government gets, uh, I mean, bad tax uh, on, on that. T T TV channel gets money and the ad makers, they get money. So who uh, actually will uh, make the streamline that you ad is socially responsible, ethically or politically correct. But what we see, like this is more of like propaganda. They are, you know, I mean, making a lot of noise, but we hardly hear that, you know, this is what is happening. Thank you, Haris. And I think there was a question for Shumon. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you, Said. Uh, it's a very interesting question. But uh, let me uh, let me not use you know all the jargons that can be used to answer this question, like global capital, national governments, and so on. So let me give you an empirical examples. Uh, so weeks ago, I met two police officers uh, who were in charge of the cyber security force of the government in a, in a round table somewhere in a newspaper. So, and someone introduced me as uh, the uh, media studies professor and fact checker. So that, that identity, you know, rang the bell uh, to both of them. And they uh, said, oh, you are, you are that guy, right? So how did you get the mandate of fact checking? I said, I did not understand. So what do you mean by mandate? I said, no, I mean, do, do you have any registration? I said, look, I'm giving a community service without any payment. So, and this is in actually in addition to the service that I'm giving to my students, this is a kind of a, you know, co-curricular activity. So why should I need a, you know, a kind of um, approval of the government and I'm doing a community service and did I do anything wrong? So, and then they said, no, I mean, oh, well, uh, we'll talk about it later, but uh, the Facebook is not doing good. Why? Because they don't, you know, obey our orders. I said, yes, they, they don't, they won't, they will not. So here, here is the global capital, right? So now the, one of the ministers of the government said, okay, we, we are not in a position to ban Facebook. So we are not in a position to ban Facebook, which means Facebook will go on. So which means now if I come to the jargon, so the global corporate will, you know, will play its own role. 
the national government will be you know in a negotiation with the global corporate all the time uh, you know, and the uh, the more powerful the government is the uh, more you know gain it can uh, have from the from from the social media giants and as bangladesh you know we all also uh, so uh, you know we have so many subscribers but well in terms of the economy that is being generated uh, from Bangladesh for Facebook is not uh, a, a very sizable economy so that we can negotiate. So if we want to negotiate, then Facebook might turn their back to us. So that's the problem for the national governments because they are in a position not to negotiate much with global corporates. So this is the fight. And at the same time, you have your civil society on Facebook with all your politically correct expressions and so on. So, which means the dialogical space is hopelessly squeezed in social media for all of us. And it will, it will go on, it will continue. So I don't see uh, the government will only uh, be the repressive force here. The government is always definitely here. And then definitely we can't uh, trust the other parties as well. Facebook, is doing a kind of fact checking activities not as a social service it's part of their corporate policy they want to clean their business so uh, facebook the government and the civil society i mean uh, it's us with all our ideologies and all our expectations so in this whirlpool where are your inappropriate behavior and then of course if you allow them to continue then well, you will see, you know, posts that can create a riot, create a communal riot, create a, a kind of a violence anywhere. So all together, my, uh, my response to your uh, question would be, well, uh, there, there is a mixed, uh, mixed uh, feeling about the government, because sometimes the government really helps you. Uh, to mitigate issues, to mitigate social tensions, but in the most of the times it is not. So now uh, we cannot settle for a single decision on this. Thank you. All right, thank you, Shumon. And this is really fascinating. This is exactly what we wanted—a proper engagement. But we are running out of time. But we—I will take last uh, two questions from uh, Mirza Taslima and Zerwat Choudhury. Um, so, Mirza Taslima, can you please ask your question? Um, you need to mute yourself. Yeah, okay. Uh, Mike, uh, I, I actually didn't ask question to Nasri. Nasri's paper was actually really fascinating. Uh, and. Uh, I know she uh, uh, she talks more on deviance uh, in her thesis. So my question is around: uh, uh, is that the, the, when the urban folk um, got uh, you know um, is on board, uh, is it uh, then the deviant got the chances in the main mainstream? That's my question. Because previously, you know, for the with the bowels and with the others, uh, the deviants were for the for the uh, uh, the cultural people uh, the in the mainstream. They were not. They they were deviant. They they were not good people. So, uh, is that changed with Darbar? Thank, thank you so much. Uh, all right, I'll take another question from uh, Zira Choudhury. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, I also have a question for Nasri, and thank you for such a brilliant talk. Um, I was really struck by the verses that you shared with us, um, the, the song, the verses from which you put up on the slide. Um, and I know you talked about it mainly in terms of gender and labor, but just even that verse where she is talking about the kind of breaking of the stones, I was just really struck by that because, you know, I know you're talking about urban folk, but it seemed to really take on this sort of quality of labor meets landscape 
this kind of breaking down of the body to the breaking down of the work um, and to the breaking down of the sort of material of the land itself in a way as well. And that seemed to really resonate in really interesting ways with that quality of Bhati Ali in particular, where the duration of the tune is, you know, speaks in such beautiful ways to the duration of the, the width of the river and the kind of the duration of the tide. So I was just wondering, like, you know, is, I mean, I think maybe to like Rosa Mendoza's earlier question about like plainlands versus hill tracks, like, is there something of the quality of the ecological, not as just this like pristine pre-industrial landscape, but as something that continues to organize the rhythm of industrial life as well, or post-industrial life that you see also permeating through some of these um, urban folk songs as well? Thank you so much for your question, Zirwat. Uh, I think I actually missed uh, Razak Khan. He had his hand raised earlier. I thought he lowered it, but anyway, Razak, please ask your question and then we'll go uh, on to the speakers for their responses. Thank you for accommodating my request. I wanted to be sure that other more participants got the chance. My apologies for missing, but I just, I hope perhaps this was addressed, but I'm curious to hear thoughts of the panelists, particularly Professor Fami Dafter, on thinking about the space of Urdu, when thinking about Bangladesh popular culture, particularly when we're thinking of genres of filmmaking, but this would also hold true for something like social media. What is the conflicted and yet the composite space that Urdu may still occupy or not occupy, given the histories of partition, but the constant focus on Bengali does, is there a possibility of doing Urdu popular culture in Bangladesh, if at all? That would be my question. Thank you so much for your question, Razak. Uh, so first I'll go to Nasreen for the specific questions that uh, were aimed at her, and then maybe any of the other panelists or Nasreen, whoever wants to take up Razak's question, please uh, feel free to go ahead. Nasreen first. Thank you. Thank you so much for the brilliant two, two questions. Uh, I, I'll go for Mr. Taslima's one first. Um, it's very interesting because uh, the songs, um, it's um, especially Mamta's song, uh, there is a tone of writing or uh, people are talking about this kind of became a guilty pleasure for the middle class. If I, if I, if, if I uh, understand correctly that uh, mainstream you refer kind of middle class um, us uh, the way we see like the, so it's from the marginal to the center so in the middle class our main mainstream cultural scenario and i i can't i can say from myself that um it it, it the, the idea of deviance especially of not all not only from uh, from um Mamta songs but also especially for um uh, nargis akhtar nargis akhtar's famous song um I think Piriter Khatar Tole, I think it is the most heard song of this genre ever. But it's so difficult to, um, to, to, to actually locate Nargis Akhtar because it's so deviant. The song is so, um, it has been used as a pornographic purpose. It has been listened to by, by um, from many people. And I first heard that song when I was like, uh, undergraduate student, first student, and uh, within our circle, it was popular. Like we we used to uh, make fun of it, and uh, not only make fun, like it's, it's 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 became a point of reference of like certain kind of uh, expression, sexual expression as well. So I I think that the, the, that deviance, uh, in fact, in the main, mainstream, not probably so uh, in a visible way. But um, yeah, it is. It has. It 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 creates space in the mainstream and in, in, in a very different form. And it has a both side of argument that it can be objectified, uh, or also it can be uh, can actually produce a sense of uh, self agency to our sexuality. And it really opens up. Uh, uh, vocabulary for middle even for middle class people who cannot talk about, especially for women who actually do not have vocability to talk about sexuality. So uh, they kind of provides uh, that, although not very um, 
you know, in a discursive level, but within, you know, within the closed circles. So I, I do think that it, it does, uh, uh, does uh, flow to the mainstream and in a different way. And uh, the, this is a brilliant question made by Zirwat. Um, it, I mean, I, the interesting part of um, um, Kangalini Sufia's song, that breaking stone, I analyzed it that it's also kind of breaking the stereotypes of female worker as a only for garments um, garments a worker because of this you know fine fingers theory that women have uh, and that's why they are they're the most uh, the, so wh whoever women uh, female workers are they're the, they're the garments workers um, apparel workers but women have been doing uh, breaking the stones all the time and always. Right? So it, it, it's not new thing, uh, especially our, our, our urban laborers. And they do the physical, uh, like not only breaking the stone, but also carrying the, you know, uh, carrying the um, um, construction material and everything uh, all the time. So that song breaks that stereotype. Uh, but the thing you mentioned, which is I also talk about a little bit, I talked about the, the way uh, for Bhatiali, the sound of tides, it's essential, and how the environment kind of became a part of the whole emotional atmosphere that it creates, that the song creates a kind of affective, and the affect creates, and through the, through the materiality of the, of the river, and I think I will take your take your question as a suggestion to look beyond the way you say the sounds of um, sounds of breaking the stones might have some kind of resonance with the music. But I, to be honest, I didn't um, explore that. But I, yeah, it is it's really interesting to um, side to be looked at. Thank you. Thank you, Nasreen. Uh, does anyone want to take up Raza Khan's uh, question? Uh, may I? Shumon? Yes, of yeah. course. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, well, that's a very, I think, uh, uh, unexplored okay. area uh, in, uh, for the for the Bangladeshi scholarship because you know you can faintly remember uh, Joey Rahan was you know doing Urdu film. And the whole lot of you know uh, Bangladeshi people are engaged in making the films, and and they made super hit films. But you know, in the mainstream Bangladeshi narrative, the the part is totally absent. At the same time, uh, we have actually a, a, a kind of a faint but ongoing culture of Urdu literature being practiced in Dhaka. Uh, sometimes it is being featured in newspapers, but you know there is no research on this so far uh, to my knowledge so to answer your question yes very much i think uh, the you know doing urdu culture in dhaka would be a very much uh, you know a very much fascinating subject for for any upcoming researcher <clears throat> yet to be explored one i guess okay for me that you can i can add I, I, yeah. <laughs> here is my answer the first question the first uh, uh, one thing i need to mention you re only remember the things you want to remember. So in Bangladeshi film, uh, film history or Bangladeshi national history, 71 uh, gives a scar. And we have a, that, that scar uh, regarding Pakistan. So even though Bangladeshi, many filmmakers, they made films in Urdu during 1960s and 1970s. They didn't even they didn't even try to circulate their Urdu films among Bangladesh. You know the song of Pakistan was made by uh, Foridur Reza Shagor's father. So Foridur Reza, he is owning a television station. He never tried to broadcast that Urdu film. So you need to understand the, <laughs> the attitude. Although we love Pakistani players. Uh, during the Zia's period, Aisha's period, Aisha tried to Zia tried to bring Nur Jahan uh, to play the um, uh, song, and uh, Runawala sometimes uh, tried to uh, sing the Madam Mas Calendar, even though they are not popular uh, because of the scar we had. And uh, Dohi Rahan's Bahana was the first cinema scope in the entire Pakistan, among East Pakistan and West Pakistan. And still today, Bangladesh government didn't try or they have tried 
uh, but I'm not sure. Uh, it is not circulated in, uh, it is not that much, that much welcomed in Bangladesh. And even though Paul Johir Rahel actually disappeared in 1972, but his contemporary, many filmmakers who made Urdu films, they didn't try to recover their films and to circulate their films in Bangladesh because they know the audience attitude. Even though we love we, most of the young uh, fellows, they, they like Pakistani players, but uh, in case of uh, recovering uh, the those films or starting watching Urdu films, I don't think it has that much, uh, it will not that much welcomed by the Bangladeshi audience. Since we had <laughs> many Urdu films made by our own filmmakers. Uh, and I told about Foridu Reza Shago, his father <laughs> made the song of Pakistan. He never tried to broadcast it. And his father didn't return to Bangladesh either. I think he died in Pakistan or Kolkata. So uh, I hope uh, that Bahana, <laughs> if we can recover Johiran's Bahana, Sangam, uh, it will be a, a great assets for us. But uh, the I don't know. <laughs> Film actually uh, it relates the um, screening and uh, because in, in YouTube we can watch many Urdu films, but we don't watch. I don't know why. We watch Hindi films, so there is a culture not uh, uh, for not having uh, because uh, the film actually um, it easily uh, it influences the audience. And the Bangladeshi audience, they never tried actually to watch Urdu films regularly. And because uh, still uh, today it is available on online, but uh, for a long time it was not available. And uh, the culture, uh, we feel more, um, <laughs> more uh, closer to India than uh, Pakistani culture. Uh, probably, I don't know. <laughs> Thank but, you, Fahmida. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, Thank you, Hamid. I think uh, Said Ferdos also had something to say about that. Uh, Raza Khan, at the very end of this uh, the, of this day of this session, you bring up something, and we really respond. <laughs> I, I really like to respond. Yes, um, uh, I have a slight disagreement with uh, Hamida when she says that like Damadam Maskalandar, we don't like that son. I but I very much like that son, like Damadam Mas. Maskalanda, and I think many among us actually likes the song. But yes, she is right that there is this nationalist scar that actually narrowed down people's choices and the market and the state is there also playing with emotions and those things. Yes, there is this emotion. There is this emotion and there, there are this scar. And this is unfortunate that there are actually uh, like uh, we are we are not close to Pakistan anymore culturally that we like to feel, but at the same time there is this new uh, feeling in the uh, among in the uh, 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 lately in recent years that we are against Pakistan that doesn't necessarily mean that we are closer to India we are closer to India no not that so it's interesting like there is this tussle and this tussle is translated in the cultural world, in everyday politics, in everywhere. So the thing is, yes, uh, that's true what uh, Famida said, that in cultural production, you won't find any recent instance of uh, any recent attempt. Uh, and uh, if any such attempt worked against the nationalist, like there was this uh, movie, you uh, I, I don't know whether you have heard the name Mehzan, uh, it just, try to question the nationalist uh, uh, discourses about 1971 and immediately that was labeled as subversive. So that is a big, huge problem. Like this is not healthy for anyone. Like you can always, you should, and particularly academia, particularly creative genre, they are bound to question or transgress the nationalist, sh shallow nationalist territories and boxes. So that doesn't really happen. And what Shumon actually mentioned in Dhaka, uh, there is 
the small literary circle who are still, and there are Urdu speaking people, like there are people who came from the other side and who are, and who became like, uh, who struggled with their identity for many years. And so there are people who still try to uh, uh, like uh, practice poetry or literary, who still uh, uh, try to produce uh, creative work in their language, in their mother tongue. And good to know that uh, if not enough, if not adequate, but in newspapers, in mainstream newspapers, sometimes you can see like uh, Zabed Hussain's work. Zabed Hussain is actually doing fantastic work on Urdu poetry and Urdu poets. And so this, this is actually, there are these little streams there that would like, like we, uh, I think uh, from, uh, from my perspective, I would say, like academia and intelligentsia and the creative uh, genre, they are bound to explore all the horizons and not to bound within any shallow nationalist framework. That's what I, uh, I think. I, I hope, uh, uh, if not enough, but I, I hope I try to respond to you uh, with my little ability. Uh, thank you, Said Ferdos. Uh, we've gone way past our time, but we do have uh, two more questions. So uh, I, I'll take them. One is from Zerawat, and there's another uh, mess, uh, question on text. Famida Akhtar mentioned in, uh, this is from Sara, uh, I can, Sara Shahid. Uh, so Famida Akhtar mentioned in her recommendations a funding allocation for women filmmakers and a separate training program for marginalized women. Is that an assumption that uh, such funding mostly go to upper class women and that working class people do not have tools to produce visual culture? I'm curious to understand given that the landscape of women filmmakers is in the hands of bourgeois women, is female representation in Bangladeshi cinema innately a marginalizing act? I am thinking of Rubaiyat Hussain, for example, who um, is not only upper uh, class, but belongs to uh, a political family and has gone to make films on garment workers. Is there a loss of agency within such practices? Uh, and I'll take the question from Zirwat as well. Uh, and please, if, if we can keep it really brief, we are going to end it after that. Zirwat. Yeah, um, not so much a question actually, it was just a response to the last discussion um, about especially Muscalander, which has had a whole new life as well thanks to the Indian satellite channels with Abda Parveen, Runa Laila, and Asha Bosley's joint performance and its subsequent uh, popularization also to drag queens like Lahore Vajasan. So I think, you know, this, I mean, maybe to echo the point that, um, you know, Said Ferdos was making that to want to stick to is this Bangladeshi, is this Urdu and all of these nationalist categories. I think a lot of our youth are not beholden to them and perhaps we should be less so too. <laughs> Thank you so much, Azirwat. Uh, uh, Fahmida, do you want to respond really quickly to that question? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, I started my career working in Pushika. That moment, uh, Pushika, Pushika is a name you in Bangladesh. So I started working there in 1998. Uh, uh, that was my first job. So I saw while uh, I was in Pushika that uh, in Pushika has a uh, uh, development center you know, across whole Bangladesh during that time. So there they actually trained women uh, to shoot their uh, surrounding their daily lives, their voice, if there is any industries. So they had a program to train up those women and it inspired me a lot. But when I entered to media, I worked in television as producer uh, for nearly three years. I saw that media is actually uh, media. They, they, they are corporate bodies. They don't have that much responsibility to, to, to create women filmmakers from grassroots. But the, who asked the question, he's right, that actually the representation we see, that is mostly the representation made by uh, middle class and upper class uh, women. Uh, and maybe in independent filmmakers, uh, lower middle class uh, women are coming, 
but uh, in mainstream films it is very difficult to get access to that network to the studio setup or to the funding or to the entire technical uh, production facilities it is actually very hard to access there so and <laughs> for lower middle class women mm -hmm. so there should be there should be a, a some training or somebody should start this sort of uh, uh, initiative to train the uh, uh, grassroots women or ethnic uh, minority women to train about the technical uh, aspects of filmmaking so that uh, nowadays mobile is very available to anybody but uh, still if they are uh, under the trainings they are under the fundings they can uh, they can also make films so which right, is thank you okay <laughs> sorry to okay. cut you off again so but okay. we're really running short of time i know okay. this is really fascinating and it's very very a good conversation uh, but i'm really sorry to cut everyone off uh, i think there was one last comment from razak i'll i'll give you two sentences <laughs> did you want to say something razak Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. I, I just want to, I must thank Sayed Saab and others because I think this is such an important conversation. And I just want to pay my homage to Runa Lela, who by the way remains the only singer both in India and Pakistan, who's from Bangladesh, that circulates in the most diverse popular culture across divide. So there's a reason I asked that question to think about popular culture precisely across national boundary. And I have to thank Sayed Saab for his wonderful insight into this. And thank you so much for giving me the space. All right, thank you so much, Razak. It was really good to have your question. Um, okay, and now we really have to end. I really want to thank all the speakers today. It was such a fascinating discussion. It was really good. This is exactly what we wanted, the kind of engagement we wanted.